When Justin II lost his grip on reality, he handed over the reins of the Empire to his old friend and current bodyguard captain Tiberius. Tiberius later went on to become Tiberius II Constantine and ruled officially as emperor from 378 to 382. This is his story. The friendship between Justin II and Tiberius dates back to when both men were serving under Justinian. Uh, they were on a campaign together in the Balkans and they became fast friends and that is why Justin eventually appointed Tiberius to be the head of the excubators under him. You obviously want to really entrust your safety to someone you trust and Tiberius was someone he deemed completely trustworthy. Now Tiberius was also known for being very good looking even as an older guy and he apparently was someone who the Empress Sophia found very attractive. Um, at least if our sources are to be believed. Now in 574, um, Sophia prevailed upon her husband to choose regents to rule in his stead since Justin had slipped mentally. So he chose Sophia, his wife, and also his good friend Tiberius. Sophia was the one who convinced him to skip over his own relatives and go straight to Tiberius because she thought he was hot, maybe or just because he was much more experienced and better able to run the empire, who knows. Obviously, uh, you know, Sophia did not write the history, so her motives maybe got a little bit simplified um, at the expense of what may have been a very intellectually motivated decision on her part, we don't know. Now, there's a 99% chance, because of all of that I just said, that uh, you know Empress Sophia and Tiberius were having an affair, at least for the four years that um, Tiberius was Caesar under Justin II. And by the way, he officially became Caesar several months after his appointment as, as regent, when Justin II was having another moment of lucidity, and he looked into what Tiberius was doing with his power and he was really pleased so he decided to further entrust Tiberius with more power so he made him a Caesar which is basically a junior emperor if you'll recall and that's why I chose to use the graphic from the Tetrarchy because in that arrangement you had a senior emperor the Augustus and a junior emperor the Caesar and this relationship really calls that back and I think the image of the two working in concert and being like brothers is fitting considering the relationship between Justin II and Tiberius, which apparently was not a relationship that was not undermined by Tiberius being with Justin's wife, if that was the case, which I assume it was. Um, when Justin died, he, uh, Tiberius, I mean, promised Sophia at her urging that he would leave his own wife and marry her. Therefore, she would remain as empress and he would become emperor. Seems like a pretty good deal for both. Well, Tiberius changed his mind at the last minute after Justin was dead, and he decided to take the title of Tiberius II Constantine and then make his own wife Empress, and that led to Sophia's influence waning as now she was just a former Empress, and this put Tiberius in sole command of the Empire. So now that he has full power, what does he do with it? One positive thing as a person trying to teach about Tiberius II is that he was Caesar for four years and then Augustus for four years, so it makes it pretty easy to divide his foreign policy into two parts. You know, nice and easy right down the middle, four years and four years. So basically what he does as Caesar is one of his first moves is to restore um, the policy that Justin II had ended by paying subsidies to keep peace. and. His intention is to get the Persians to, you know, stop attacking so he can get enough troops in the east in order to then deter them militarily. So he does that. Um, he also makes an alliance with the Franks to attack the Lombards. Um, you know, under Justin II, the Lombards had invaded Italy and they were taking more and more territory. So what he does is he wants the Franks to hit the Lombards from behind. Um, it also helps that the Franks are fellow Orthodox Christians. So you know, they see eye to eye. However, the plan gets foiled because his general in Italy gets completely defeated and dies in the battle, and that causes the Lombards to take over more territory in Italy, 
And then, you know, the Franks at that point kind of back off from their war aims because at that point it had become useless. He has two chief generals in the east um, fighting Persia. One of them is Justinian, who was the son of Justin, son of Germanus, who did not become emperor. And his other general is a much more important guy named Maurice, who we'll see a lot of in the future. Um, there's one point when he was Caesar where Justinian, the same guy who's the general, was trying to plot with Sophia to overthrow Tiberius as Caesar, but um, Tiberius agreed to pardon him after he paid him a lot of gold. You know, a nice bribe. I'm sorry for killing you or trying to kill you. Here's a big sum of money. I guess that works. Um, and needless to say, after that attempt, Justinian stopped being an important general, and then Maurice was more in power than ever in, on the eastern frontier. So in 578, the long-suffering Justin II dies, and now Tiberius is effectively emperor in his own right. Well, he continues his general policy of restoring traditional Byzantine foreign policy, so he restores subsidies to the Avars in order to try to deter them, but this is ineffective because they are able to penetrate the frontier almost immediately and cause some real problems. Now, his real emphasis as both Caesar and Augustus was on the eastern frontier, especially on the Persian and Armenian frontier. That's where he has his best general, Maurice. He has his biggest armies. Um, and probably to get those armies up to snuff, he might have stripped away some of the units that were supposed to be in the Balkans. At least that's how it would appear based on what happens. He also has some successes in North Africa. His generals there win some battles against the Berbers. Those victories are not very long-lived, and North Africa will never really be what it once was, um, and we'll see that un under Tiberius's successor, things continue to decline in North Africa. But for now, things are looking good. Um, in 579, there was enough frontier stability at, that on both the Balkan front and the Persian front that uh, he Tiberius was able to take his new units and try to get things back to normal in Italy and Spain. So he sends more troops to both fronts. However, Probably while those troops are still on the boats uh, sailing to their new destination, the city of Sirmium falls to the Avars in 579, and Sirmium is the main obstacle between the Roman frontier and the Balkans. Uh, you know, at least the interior of the Balkans where you can raid and get a decent amount of booty and whatnot. So when that falls, the uh, people uh, subject to and allied with the Avars called the Slavs began to heavily settle the Balkans. That's something we'll talk about in more detail um, going forward, I believe next week, actually. So, um, despite the fact that he'd already tried and failed once, General Justinian, you know, now several years removed from his last command, tries another plot against Tiberius. This fails, not surprising. So he pays money again to get out of it. That works again somehow, Tiberius pardons him. And then he dies in 582, the same year as Tiberius himself, of natural causes, not because he was executed. As for Tiberius II's domestic policy, it's, you know, safe, if not quite kind, to say that he didn't really have any ideas. Um, his one major policy initiative, which is fairly unique, is that every year as Augustus, starting with his accession and going to his last year in 582, he handed out 7,200 pounds of gold a year to the population of Constantinople. This is in an effort to court popularity with the people. Um, maybe he looked back at the time of Justinian, you know, 40, 50 years before, and he said, hey, uh, those riots can get pretty scary, so maybe if I just make sure that people love me, there's no way that one of these riots could um, get out of control and could be suborned by a bunch of aristocrats trying to overthrow me. So maybe a smart move, but maybe not. And he also maybe was fearing that the population was still loyal to the Justinian dynasty. So he made lots of gestures to show his own fealty to that dynasty. Um, for instance, not killing the general Justinian twice, probably a pretty good sign that Tiberius was trying to signal that he had some sort of um, affection for that family. He did relax taxes, which can also be interpreted as a way to try to gain some aristocratic and popular uh, support. 
Obviously, a lot of people tend to like it when they pay less taxes. And he did do a little bit of building. It's not really clear that he did anything too extravagant. He might have just repaired a few buildings. He might have built a couple of minor churches, something like that. Anyway, it's, not, it's nothing too big or grand, but he did a little bit of building. So, despite the fact the Empire was not doing all that hot, it was still chugging along, albeit at a subpar rate. So, Tiberius has created a little bit of a dilemma for modern historians trying to read his mind. Um, so, it, usually when you marry your daughter to someone, you're signaling your intention that that person should succeed you. And Tiberius decided to marry one of his two daughters to the general Maurice, and one to Germanus, the son of Justinian, who tried to kill him twice. Um, so you would think that maybe he's trying to establish two emperors. Um, and there has been a theory that maybe he wanted Germanus to go west while Maurice would hold the east. You know, Maurice would hold what we know as Byzantium, and then maybe Germanus would go hold, you know, Italy, what they had in Spain and North Africa, and maybe he was trying to reestablish the Western Empire as a formal thing. However, uh, that's not what ended up happening. Maurice ends up getting the whole thing, and it looks like there was never any real question of uh, Germanus being emperor. Um, it looks like he and Maurice got along fine, and um, Germanus, or at least someone named Germanus, is later named as a patrician. If it is the same guy, then it just means that um, he would have had to have gotten that office from Maurice, meaning that they were cool with each other. Um, now, Tiberius dies at a time when the Empire is once again in a crisis. There had been another Persian invasion, while also he was doing a negotiation with the Avars. So in 582, he had ceded the frontier city of Sirmium formally to the Avars, you know, three years after the fact. Um, they demolished the city, so there's no way the Byzantines could retake it and reestablish that frontier in the same way that it had been before. And uh, at the same time, though, Maurice did check another major Persian invasion and win a big battle, a battle that kept the peace for about 20 years. However, Maurice had to rush home to Constantinople because it looks like Tiberius was poisoned and he died. It's also possible that he just... Uh, was old. Um, he wasn't a young man, as I mentioned earlier. So, but you know, it makes a better story if he's poisoned. So let's just go with that. He was poisoned, but it took a long time for the poison to kill him, and he entrusts the empire to Maurice. In assessing the reign of Tiberius II, I'm looking not only at his short time as Augustus from 578 to 582 but also his years as Caesar when he was, for all practical intents and purposes, already the senior emperor, 574 to 578. All of these, this whole entire eight-year period will be considered in this. And just like a lot of other emperors from this period, his main problem is that there are some fundamental issues facing the Byzantine Empire, such as overextension and an inability to, gather, to gain some sort of permanent settlement on any frontier. He doesn't really address any of that, so the major problems that continue to plague his empire are the same as they were when he took power. Um, he's competent, he runs the state relatively well, but he's uninspired, and he doesn't really show a great deal of enthusiasm for tackling great big problems. He does show some loyalty to the Justinianic dynasty, and he certainly demonstrates mercy and his dealings with the general Justinian. This probably helped him to maintain his power, even though he was not a member of that dynasty. And it also gave him enough legitimacy that he could appoint Maurice, who was also not a member of the Justinianic family. Um, he apparently was reasonably well-liked. This is a saint's image, and supposedly this was one of the saints from an earlier period who they didn't really um, have an appearance for. They didn't know what the guy looked like. So they just basically painted Maurice, or not Maurice, but um, Tiberius II, and they said, well, you know, you're a really good emperor and a really good guy, so, you know, this, this saint was a good guy, we'll just assume that he looked kind of like you, it'd, you know, it'd be a fitting thing. Um, one thing you can say for Tiberius II, as with many of his 6th century predecessors, is that he did manage to choose a worthy successor, and he was able to ensure a smooth transition of power. 
and he gave the empire to Maurice, who was probably the best emperor of this period, at least until Heraclius. But there's a lot of controversy about Heraclius, which we'll get to in due time. 